Hello, and today I'm going to talk to you about queuing. So here's the objectives. Uh, you're going to want to use queuing concepts to reduce waiting, but then when waiting exists, how can you uh, eliminate or reduce the adverse impact of it? So what is queuing theory? Well, it's a very complex mathematical method of analyzing waiting. And, and so I'm not going to get into the math today, but I will show you uh, how you can, some simple ways you can reduce cues, what, what factors actually drive cues, and then if you have weights or cues that form, uh, how can you minimize the impact of those? So waiting lines, again, it's not limited to people. Uh, it can be uh, stacks of papers. If you're talking medical records, it could be medical records that are just piling up. So it is an important thing to note is it's not just people waiting in a line. This is some common types of questions you could have. You could, you could when you're considering queuing, is how many receptionists should we should we have in a clinic? Uh, what percent of the customers will have uh, some specified wait? You know, if a customer tells you they don't want to wait any more than 30 minutes, well, what percent of our customers actually wait longer than 30 minutes? Um, so you need to use queuing theory to, to help answer some of those questions. So why do we care? Well, there's inefficiency and then there's customer perceptions. So if we have inefficient processes, we're not seeing as many people or processing as many things as we should or as, the, as we could through an efficient process. So ultimately your throughput gets affected. And then there's the customer perceptions. So if we have long waits, do customers get upset? Do they leave the business? Do they take their business somewhere else? Here's an example of a queue. So you can see the iPhone 6, just a really obnoxious line uh, waiting for, for that phone. Okay, so capacity, this is one driver of queues. So capacity is the, the number of units a facility can hold, receive, store, produce in a given amount of time. So this, this is impacted by the number of staff you have, the number of equipment you have, and, and so on. So ultimately, if your capacity is greater than your demand, well, then, then you're okay, uh, generally speaking. If your demand is, exceeds your capacity, well, then you're going to have very long waits. It's going to ultimately lead to overutilization, which I'll get into here. So you have factors that affect queues. You have this average service time. You have a utilization which considers both demand and capacity. And then it's your process variability. So an arrival rate variability. So if, if your process, maybe one, is, you have a process step and it, it on average takes one minute, but sometimes it takes 10 minutes and other times it takes 10 seconds. Well, that could potentially be problematic if you're if that 10 minute uh, visit or whatever occur step occurs early in the process or early in the day for example well then it's ultimately going to lead to to larger waits as for other people that come through the process uh, ensuing so process variability is is the enemy of what of lines of queues. So if, if you if you don't want queues, well then have low process variability and have have consistent arrival rate variability. If we have 10 people show up at 8 but 40 show up at 9, well then I hope that you can staff accordingly. Be, but if you have 10 show up today at 8, but then tomorrow we have 30, well that, that's problematic as well. So as best we can, we want to, to measure the arrival rates. We want it to measure the, the process rates and see if there is variability and if there's consistent variability. You know, perhaps on Mondays, we have 10 people show up at 8, but then on Tuesdays, we have on average 30. Well, we know 
and we can measure those things. Okay, so capacity considerations forecast demand accurately. Again, measure, measure, measure. Try to try to get an, an accurate read on what is happening in your process. Match the technology and equipment, and then find the uh, optimal operating size. Should we do batches? Should we not? And then build build for change. So consider those things, and then and then build your processes and make changes accordingly. So here's a medical provider example. The patient, or there was production of 80, 80 patients. Um, the provider operates five days a week, so eight hours, or sorry, nine hours a day, but then they take a one-hour lunch, so that leaves eight hours. They design capacity for that provider, so that provider is supposed to see two and a half patients per hour. That's, that's what we estimate the provider can see based on historical production. Okay, so the capacity per week would be five days times the eight hours the provider is available per day times the two and a half patients per hour, which gives you 100 patients for the week. But however, we said this provider only saw 80 patients last week. Okay, so the capacity was 100 because we expected the patient or the provider to see 100 patients. However, they only saw 80. Okay, so demand, actual demand divided by capacity. 80% utilization. You could argue that it's bad because ideally you'd want the provider to see 100% um, so that they're using all of their time. But the, the, the negative to that, if you have 100% capacity, is, is what if there is variability? So we say a provider can see two and a half patients per hour. Well, what if one, one patient brings a complex set of issues that you didn't plan for, and so this patient takes one hour? Well, if that happens, everybody else after that patient is going to have significant weights. So at 80% capacity, the, the idea is 85% is kind of your ideal, your, your target for, for most processes because it allows for some variability in the process without significantly impacting weights. Okay, so service sector demand, capacity management. Here's some ways that they do that. You can ma uh, manage it with appointments, reservations. You can do the first come, uh, first served rule. You can have temporary or part-time staff. So with staffing and, and managing your capacity that way, you add more staff for peak periods. So here's some queuing system designs. You can have a lot of different ways that queues, uh, queues are, are structured. Here's just kind of the dentist or grocery store model where somebody comes in, they wait in a line, and then they're served. Here's the McDonald's drive through So they wait in this drive through line, then they hit the, the cashier, takes their money. That's in a phase one. And then phase two, two is where they get their food. So multi-phase. This is an example of a single server, single phase. And you often, again, see this at the grocery store. So there's lines behind each one of these cash registers. And so you may have one line where patients are, or not patients, but uh, customers are go through very quickly of a fast cashier. But then some other line is really slow. So by structuring it this way, it's kind of it's it's set up or designed to fail because people notice how long it's taking in their line compared to other lines. And if their line is longer, they can get upset. Okay, here's a, a, a probably a better way of of structuring lines particularly from that grocery store model. And so here you have a queue and then you have people go or customers go to one of three different uh, servicing staff. So they wait in a single line, but then whichever channel is open first, that's where the customer goes. 
So you'll see this sometimes in fast food. Wendy's was known for, for, for doing this. Um, you'll see this here in the airline industry. So for ticketing purposes or baggage, this is how, how it works. You get this long winding queue, and then whichever person is available first, then the customer goes to that person. So there's not, there's not different lines. Or there are not different lines behind each server. Instead, there's one line. Here's a good article that, that talks about what Whole Foods did and how they benefited from, from what you just saw there. So here's a key insight, which is that utilization, uh, as it approaches 100%, the weighting grows exponentially. That's why I said so if you want to target, in general, 85% is, is a good utilization rate. Now let's get into some appointment scheduling schemes. So we, we mentioned that, that appointments is one way that we can manage demand. And so when you have appointments, you're maximizing utilization and minimizing waiting time. That's kind of your, your goal. And so you have all these different appointment types. That's not to say if you have appointments, you will not have waits. Because as we know, especially in the medical industry, some, some patients take longer than others. And so while we might have managed or budgeted a certain amount of time for someone, if that person goes over that allotted time, then we, then we have waits for the subsequent uh, patients or customers. So here's, here's a way the Bailey Welch uh, design schedule. So instead of the standard approach, which is over here on the left, where you have appointment scheduled every 20 minutes, here you would have two, two uh, patients scheduled for this first block. And so what this does is it allows for no-shows. If a patient doesn't show up, well then you, you just still have another patient that's, that's constantly being seen. So th again, this prevents no-shows, but what it does is it also increases weights, potentially. Because if, if both of these people show up here at the beginning of the day, obviously one of them is going to wait. So again, th this, this is one way where you can, you can try to increase utilization by eliminating the effect or minimizing the effect of no-shows, but again, it, it may increase weights. So here's some other ways you can manage demand. Uh, you have the traditional, which is the high no-show rates that we just talked about, and then you can manage that with double and triple booking kind of through that Bailey-Welch model. But then you have the advanced or open access, where the patients come in, they're seen the same day, there's a reduced no-show uh, rate because there are no appointments and so people just show up when they need care and so if you're able to truly manage this by by studying the data knowing the customer uh, demand rates on given days of the week given hours of the day you can truly manage open access and manage it well and ultimately reduce these these no-show rates or outright eliminate them so implementing advanced or open access, as I said, you really want to be able to predict demand and predict your capacity. Here's some different metrics you could look at if you wanted to introduce uh, open access. And now we'll get into how to reduce, or sorry, summarize how to reduce the weight. So what you want to do is, again, gather that data. You really want to know what your demand is you want to know, and so you can predict the demand and you can predict your, your capacity. How many staff do we have? Do we have staff that call in sick? Um, what day of the week is staff more likely to call in sick? Okay, so really get at the data and, and study this. Avoid the single server, single phase queuing model. And then avoid staff overutilization or utilization that approaches 100% or exceeds 100%. So what if I have waiting? How can I minimize the impact? You're going to have waits, so what can you do? Well here, there's a David Meister wrote an article, The Psychology of Waiting, and it's an excellent article that talks about the impact of waits. 
and, and how you can reduce that impact in the customer's eyes. So unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time. If you have a TV up there in the corner and you're, you're watching the news, as opposed to just staring off into space when you're waiting, it feels like it's a lot less. Pre-process wait feels longer than in-process. So if you think of your doctor's office, if you're, if nothing has happened to you and you're just sitting there in the lobby, it feels a lot longer than if you are checked in, you go to your room, they take your vitals, and then you sit and wait for the, the physician. So you've had this wait initially, but it's shorter, then you go to the exam room, you get something done, and then you wait. It doesn't feel as long as if you had a consistently long wait. And then there's, there's others. Anxiety makes so if the unknown. If you're sitting in that exam room and nobody's seen you for 30 minutes, well, you're, you're wondering what, what's happening here. So having somebody come in and tell you that the, the wait is expected to be 30 minutes or your wait will be another 10 minutes it actually helps because it takes away that anxiety. Uncertain weights are longer than known weights. Again, it goes back to what I just mentioned. The same with unexplained weights are longer than explained. If you've been seen by your physician and they say, well, we just need to check the results of this, this test, and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting, well, that, that takes a lot, a lot longer than if nobody told you anything at all. Or sorry, a lot shorter if, if, than if nobody told you. You know you're waiting for that test. They tell you it's going to take 30 minutes to get the results back. And so you're, you're, you tend to be more comfortable with that wait than if somebody just said, well, we need to go and, and check the results and we'll be back shortly. Well, what, what is shortly to you? Shortly to you might be different than shortly to someone else. So you explain it. You're specific. Uh, that tends to minimize the impact of, of the wait. Okay, so here's here's excellent uh, example of wait times. And I'll just bring this up. So Methodist for their ER, they have the average ER wait time, and it, it tells you by location how long you can be expected to wait. Again, very very helpful uh, when when you're when you're thinking about going to the ER. You you know it going before you go in. Where can you post wait times? Could you post them in, a, in the pharmacy? Could you post them in urgent care? I mean, having, having those posted, it gives the idea to the customer how long they will have to wait. Now, the key here is sometimes is the enemy of always. So if you leave it up to individual staff members to have to go in and tell the patient, well, your wait will be about 20 minutes. As opposed to having some signage maybe that's up in the, in the office where the, the patients, every patient that comes and sees it. Okay, some material on the slides was from Health Administration Press. 